Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you. All right, welcome to the Atheist Experience. We are live. It is Sunday, December 13th, 2015, just two days after my brother's birthday. Not that that's relevant to anybody but me and my family, but... And uh, four days before mine. And four days before Johnny I, who's joining us today. I'm Matt Delaney. This is John I. Cluddy, and uh, we're, we're here on this uh, live call-in program uh, where we discuss, you know, what, what you believe and why, have conversations, hopefully, with uh, theists, or at least uh, productive conversations that might benefit somebody, talking about uh, issues of religion and philosophy and, uh, who knows, morality, the cosmos. Whatever comes up. We don't know. It's a call-in <laughs> show. We'll talk about the, the things that people call in about. And, and uh, as I mentioned last week, we uh, were working towards the uh, phone solution. It's been approved. I'm, I'm imagining by the end of January um, we will have everything up and running. Um, equipment is ordered. Equipment is ordered. Sweet. And, uh, but in the meantime, we're still taking calls via Skype. If you looked right down there, it'll say Skype and then The Atheist Experience, no spaces, all one word. Do not call that uh, Skype handle. Just send a message and the call screener will review it. They've got a list put together and we'll just start connecting with callers. As a matter of fact, we can go ahead and get uh, Shaw queued up while I'm going through the announcements. That'd be great. Uh, yesterday, I participated in a 24-hour uh, marathon dogma debate episode to raise money for the Secular Student Alliance. Um, I'm happy to announce that uh, David and the crew managed to raise more than $100,000 over the 24-hour period, in part because of an incredibly generous matching donation from Todd Stiefel, who matched the first 50000 So uh, we raised a little over either right out or just over $2,000 during the hour that I was on. So thank you to everybody who participated, uh, who tried to make me the winning, uh, but there's no way to win when, you know, Todd's going to match things. And I heard that there were, uh, I think the scathing atheists were on and raised like 7,000 in their hour or something. Wow. That's I don't know. Great. Uh, so anyway, lots of good stuff. It is the time of year when there are a lot of fundraisers. And it, it, there's a good chance, or there's at least a reasonable chance, that uh, Bridget Gaudet from Foundation Beyond Belief will be Skyping in here in a little while to talk about their year-end fundraiser. Uh, but if, you, if that doesn't happen, I want to make sure I, I got the information out. If you go to foundationbeyondbelief.org, you can get all the information about that organization. It's a secular, secular charity organization, and their end-of-the-year fundraising efforts um, and you can decide if that is the right place for you to donate. But uh, I don't actually have any other uh, important announcements right now. Uh, so I guess we'll go to Shaw in England. Um, hi. Hi, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, sorry, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fanboy, so I'm a bit nervous. Oh, well, you'll get over <laughs> it. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> since I'm the first caller, I thought we might start out with something light. So I'd like to discuss uh, terrorism and politics, if that's okay with you. <laughs> Just, yeah, the, just a little light topic. Start with the light stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, well, I'm a Pakistani, and I'm an atheist um, in terms of you know whether or not I believe in a god or whatever. But after two years in England, I've realized that on a political slash cultural level, I still identify as a Muslim. Um, so uh, I think I, I just wanted to talk a bit about uh, the the atheist experience of a Pakistani in which I've spent most of my life as a closet atheist in Pakistan and over here because I'm brown, the basic assumption is, oh, you're brown and you're from Pakistan, well, you're a Muslim then. Right. So I've sort of experienced um, hostility from both ends of the spectrum. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so um, back in Pakistan, I can't you know, come out of the closet, so to speak, because best case scenario, I'll be jailed. Worst case scenario, I'll be murdered. Um, over here, I believe that there's uh, 
there's a, a very unfortunate and uncomfortable conflation of the Muslim identity with a brown identity, especially in the diaspora, especially after the unfortunate recent um, attacks in Paris and so on, uh, to the point that uh, I barely leave my room because I get into weird social encounters with lots of uh, people. So I mean, hmm. so so on so on the one level, I still I. I identify as a political Muslim because I'm sort of sick and tired of random people coming up to me and saying, you're Muslim scum. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I, I just, uh, I guess I just wanted to... Um, Let's see, there's, a, there's, a problem, uh, there's a problem that, that is born um, in part from ignorance and in part from fear where you have uh, radical Islamists who are without a doubt a horrific problem advocating for terrible doctrines and and uh, and advocating for violence and actually carrying out violent acts in Paris and 9-11 uh, around the world and they have doctrines that in in addition to just you know the sort of broad-scale terrorist type violence that we see um, they have uh, policies in, in doctrines that are as a humanist to me are horribly offensive in violation of individual freedoms. Uh, they don't do anything to empower individuals. They, the, the focus is on you know Allah and the religion. That is one segment of the Muslim population. Then there is a another segment of the Muslim population that is not running around doing terrorism and committing violence. And uh, there, the problem is, is that among that segment of Muslims, there are a number uh, who, without being expressly supportive of violence and terrorism are still supportive of the inhuman doctrines. Um, you know, it's one of those, they think they're doing the right thing there. They, they think they're, they're doing what they're obligated to do by Allah uh, and the Quran. And then there are more progressive Muslims outside of that realm. So as we're drawing circles out and then there's an overlap with uh, brown people. It, at least that's the way people end up looking at it. So if you're brown and and it, particularly if you have an accent which to a Westerner sounds uh, indescribably foreign, well then of course you, you're one of those Muslims and then they, are, they just slippery slope right down into the you are a threat to me when that's not the case probably for the overwhelming majority of Muslims you're going to meet and brown people that you're going to meet. And it's, it's, it's dehumanizing and it's you know, born of ignorance and fear and it results in the sort of thing that you're talking about where here you are, a non-believer who ostensibly or culturally identifies as a Muslim because of um, you know, this, this, this stigma uh, that had been applied. Uh, where you see, I can understand that. I mean, I, I don't culturally identify as a Christian at all. Uh, but if my, my family uh, were being unfairly attacked as Christians, um, I would probably have a cultural link to them that is primarily based on the rights of the individual to believe as their conscience dictates. And I, would, and, I wouldn't and want to see anybody If I may cut you off, I also think it's, um, I'm being a bit of a rationalist because I don't want to die. Yeah. And, and I don't, the thing is, though, I have no way of assessing what your risk level is. And your risk level is different from mine. And so this is one of those situations where people have to decide for themselves how much risk they're willing to accept. Uh, and you may not have good enough information to determine what your risk is. Now, I, you know, I, I would be, there's a part of me that would like to say, I don't think there's any reason for you to remain homebound, but I don't live in the UK and I'm not you. And I don't have enough information to assess the situation over there with respect to your life in particular. Uh, all I could do is, you know, kind of, broad generalities and, and statistics and that you're probably not at much as risk or as much at risk as you think you are. Uh, no, I completely I agree. Know. The people who are most at risk currently in both the US and in Europe are uh, people who much more visibly adopt uh, certain uh, aesthetic standards that are implied or prescribed by Islam. So women um, who wear the veil are, I believe, the most at risk individuals currently. That, that may in fact be the case. I don't, I don't have a lot of statistics. I, I can understand your plight. I, I, I think probably what I'm more interested in, um, you know, you were an atheist while you were in Pakistan and yes. you talked about the, the risk there. Now that you're in England, um, you are not 
openly atheistic, even though it would seem to be in your best interest, in your personal best interest, uh, to be so. And I, that that to me is interesting. You know that that you're kind of culturally identifying with the thing that puts you more at risk than what you really are, and, it, and that's kind of confusing to me. Um, uh, when I say that I uh, identify culturally as a Muslim, like uh, in the sense that when it comes to conversations with people or friends here or back home, well, they know. But uh, I believe when I say that uh, when I say that I politically identify as a Muslim, I believe that I feel an overwhelming urge to correct people's ignorance. What I feel uh, is people's ignorance and misconceptions. Mm -hmm. So, so I think I'm a political. Uh, politically, I'm a Muslim because I will. Uh, speak out against um, Islamophobic attacks, or I will try to counter people who do the whole if you're a Muslim, therefore you are likely to be a terrorist, or therefore you are likely to be radicalized. Uh, I think I identify as a political Muslim because I seek to counter the, uh, that form of ignorance. But okay. I don't pray, I don't fast. Um, we do the Eid thing, just like I assume that you do the Christmas thing, because you know the family gets together and we have kick ass food. Yeah, um, but, and also Christmas isn't Christian. Um, not in its origins or in its practice. It's it's a predominantly secular thing. Even when I was a fundamentalist Christian growing up, it was very it was made very very clear to me that there are two Christmases. There is a religious observance of uh, the the Christ Mass, the uh, the birth of Christ, and then there's a secular observance that has to do with you know Santa Claus and reindeer and presents and trees. Because if you if you ask people, you know, go around and do a poll and say, hey, what do you think of or uh, when you think of Christmas, or, or what are the most important things to you about Christmas, you get, you know, gifts, pre presents, family, family food, uh, and then you get, you know, the Santa Claus and all this stuff. Jesus might not even crack the top five, even among Christians walking out of church when, when you talk to him about <laughs> Christmas. It is, it, it is a national holiday. It is a uh, predominantly consumer-driven um secular, let's gorge ourselves, spend a lot of money and eat a lot of food type of holiday. And it, we had our Christmas party actually at our house last night um, amongst almost exclusively atheists uh, and had a great time. That's fantastic. And um, you, you might actually uh, find this interesting, but um, I'm not in the closet back in Pakistan with close friends and my family. So we're pretty much... Um, the Eid celebration isn't really as, there isn't that clear a bifurcation yeah. uh, in terms of the secular aspect or the Islamic aspect. It is straight up Islamic, but in our house, we skip the prayer bit or the thinking about God bit and we get to the, our families together and let's have uh, awesome food. Uh, my household is also, uh, generally, we are a closeted atheist family uh, living in Pakistan. And um, I think the funniest sort of bit is, um, I'm going to be going back to Pakistan shortly, and I really can't wait. I mean, I would rather be in the closet over there than be misidentified and treated with hostility as a Muslim here. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a part of me that can get that, the, the, um, that if you don't get to be fully who you are and appreciated for who you are, it might be better to, uh, to hide and, and be appreciated for what you're not. But I'm, I'm you know, when I start talking about the, what the risk is, uh, I'm, a, I'm a virtually no risk of being arrested or killed for being an atheist uh, here. And I can't imagine calling someplace home where I would have to hide who I am uh, at the risk of being killed. So, I mean, so there's a part of me that can kind of understand what you're saying, but uh, yeah, I couldn't do that. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. Like, uh, I just feel that in terms of uh, fully sort of feeling fully actualized, uh, I, I sort of get enough of a chance in a house in which my parents are absolutely supportive because they're just like me. I have a close-knit sort of uh, friend network, a lot of whom are either incredibly tolerant or are atheists. I mean, we're a very, we're a very um, sort of hidden but um, quite a, a pervasive minority in Pakistan. You can't get statistics because it's illegal for us to speak out, yeah. but um, like so there's a high risk uh, involved with it, but there's more of us than uh, you meant uh, believe. <laughs> so uh, let me ask you this, because I find this kind of curious. Is there an opportunity and, and perhaps a focus by some of you to change the laws and the perception in Pakistan with regard to non-believers? Um, it's a very, very slow climb. So um, I'm part of uh, like a 
small organization that are attempting to um, first we're just trying to legitimize the idea that laws should be more secular and less religious mm -hmm. which is a tough battle in a country that's called the Islamic Republic of Pakistan um, yes so so, so so that's the first thing that we're going for is to just sort of sway public opinion towards the idea that secular laws protect the individual just as much as religious laws do. In fact, they protect the individual more than religious laws do, and that they're a smart idea. That's the first thing. The second thing on a more personal level is um, when I do sort of come out to close friends who are Muslims, a lot of them had questions. Um, the obvious ones that you've had to face because you've been doing the show a long time, you know, where do you get your morals from? Sure. Um, but w don't you think, you know, Pascal's wager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all, all, the, all that bullshit, basically. Um, so on a personal level, it's responding to those questions one at a time. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to sort of balance this with the threat that this person might just tell somebody else, you know, hey, did you hear about Shaw? He's an atheist. And that person might get incensed to the point that they might come at me with a knife. Mm -hmm. And if they are successful, it will be legal for them to do so. Um, in like taking my life because um, not only do we have a blasphemy law, but there's also generally um, a social sort of stigma attached to the idea of blasphemy to the extent that the police don't really necessarily punish you if you can successfully demonstrate that I killed this guy because he committed blasphemy. Hmm. So technically, so, it, technically it's illegal, but it's not enforced. Is that kind of... Um, Something like that. It's actually really, really messy, um, mostly because the letter of the law is ambiguous and a lot of the law, uh, I, the way I see it, a lot of the law is interpreted and determined by whoever is in a position to enforce it at a point in time. So um, the cop who comes that particular day just might say, yeah, good for you for killing that guy. Alternatively, mm -hmm. you could get like a slightly more reasonable guy and go like, you just killed somebody. I'm still taking you to jail, you asshole. Um, something like that. I mean, slightly more formally stated, of course. Um, I, I sort of liken that to maybe what it was like being in the South 80 years ago or even 50 years ago, um, where somebody could get lynched and the, all the law enforcement, you know, a black person could be lynched and all the law enforcement kind of looks the other way and they won't mm -hmm. convict the per, the, you know, all white jury won't convict the people. Um, no, absolutely. That, I agree. That works as an analogy. Of course, I don't want to make it seem like my plight is that bad because thankfully being an atheist isn't that sort of visible a condition, right. so to yeah, speak. Yeah, you can pass a, a lot easier. Unless you go getting like an atheist tattoo on your forehead or something. <laughs> it's like, I are atheist. Yeah. Kills, and then you'd kills have to wear me a hat. now. <laughs> anyway, I, I, uh, I don't, did you have... Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's encouraging that at least people are willing to... Uh, are, are starting to transition maybe and you said that you know there's probably more atheists than you would realize and and they're closeted but you know I think that's where it starts I think you it, you you start off that way and then it gain, gains more acceptance and then eventually maybe things change so uh, that's encouraging that a, a place like Pakistan which well I'm know, wondering how much they control access to information on the internet in Pakistan like, could you um, watch the show from there? Oh, I, yes, uh, qu quite easily. Uh, YouTube was blocked for a long uh, time after that um, video came out. I don't remember. I never saw, I never, I never bothered watching the video, but there was like a bit of a um, quote-unquote offensive uh, video that a bunch of um, just like, I believe they're from the American South, just like a bunch of ignorant people um, made a video making fun of Islam or something. Yeah. That resulted in like a, demonstrations across the Muslim world and then uh, the Pakistani government's response was to block YouTube but we have uh, a lot of websites that have been that are being run by Pakistani sort of uh, web people and they're basically YouTube mirror sites um, and they provide all the same thing like basically you can watch a mirror of any YouTube video and comment on it and blah 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 uh, and so on yeah, so that's, um, that's the kind of piracy I think I could get behind <laughs> yeah. uh, where, where we're desperately trying to get information to people uh, in opposition to uh, tyrannical but the, Pakistani, uh, but, but the Pakistani parliament is currently trying to debate and pass a cyber crime bill. Um, if you are interested, I can forward it to you via email, but it, it would accord an insane degree of power 
over um, the ability to prosecute people for what they do online if the bill gets passed and becomes law. Hmm. Um, so hopefully that won't get passed. A lot of um, the free press is opposed to this. Um, it's been rewritten multiple times because of how ludicrous um, it is. So there's hope that it will not get passed. So the Pakistani government is not that good at uh, restricting. I mean, let's just say we're not China good. Okay. Um, so the best they can do is block a URL um, or block like a domain name and we can easily find a way around it. Tor works perfectly fine, like worst case scenario, right? Um, so yeah, uh, the Pakistani government really isn't that good at uh, blocking the internet. So yes. I don't, think any, I don't think anybody would be good at that. There's always going to be people who can find a way around stuff like that, even in China. Absolutely. Um, it's, I think it's easier some places than others. Yeah, for sure. Abs absolutely. For example, uh, in UAE, it's very, very easy to control the internet because, as I understand, there's only one internet service provider um, in Dubai, at least. Um, mm. um, and I think, I, I really don't know the logic behind it, but as I understand, the more uh, internet service providers there are, um, the easier it is or the more difficult it is to uh, block access to internet uh, content because you have to sort of deal with each ISP individually, I believe. Yeah. And the thing is, is that I'm kind of convinced that this is inevitable, that uh, yes, there are going to be conflicts and there are going to be terrible situations, but uh, barring the destruction of the earth and humanity, uh, access to information, uh, I, just, my, I think it's just going to keep improving for everybody. Uh, it, it's it's one of those things where you once something is known and the idea has spread, um, it's very difficult to contain it, and the world is just generally getting smaller. You have to, you know, no matter how isolated you would like your particular nation to be, the odds are pretty good that you're going to have to interact with people, and that these interactions are going to make the world more smaller and hopefully more cooperative. Uh, in addition to getting more information out. But. Absolutely. And um, I, I think I've taken up a lot of your time. If I could just sort of add one more thing and then, uh, you know, if you guys are done with me, maybe we could move on to the next caller. All right. Thanks. Um, um, I think the final sort of, I think, interesting uh, or not interesting, just like a final point that I think uh, I need to make is that um, the sort of issue of blasphemy, you know, of uh, violence against um, other minorities and so on and so forth, um, there is an urban-rural divide uh, that also, I think, factors in, term in Pakistan. Now, my statistics are horrible because I read this a few years ago, mm -hmm. but there, I believe there is a distinction between um, being a Muslim as a religious identity or as a cultural identity. And to underscore what I mean, um, a lot of, for example, I'm, I'm, uh, I grew up in the city. Uh, I'm an urban kid. But I do have a rural background and I do have a village and we go there like every month or so and we hang out with, um, you know, our relatives there. Uh, I would describe them as culturally Muslim because they don't really care. Like they go about the motions, but they don't really reflect on these things or they don't really give that much of a crap about what your faith is or what their neighbor's faith is. They're kind of just Muslim because they were born Muslim and it works. Yep. Um, Alternatively, the same thing is have, the same thing is true for Christianity in in a couple of different ways, but but like but, but on the other hand, where you have um, religion as an outright religious identity, where you sort of um, where you want to spread the house of Islam, where other uh, religious um, sort of schools or uh, whatever what have you, where they're the incorrect ones, that's where you have organized violence. So, for example, um, the Shia. Islamic identity experiences a lot of violence in Pakistan and they can't help it because they are a visible sort of identity. So um, in cultural terms, I'm a Sunni Muslim. So I'm a middle class male Sunni Muslim, which would mean that I'm probably in the most privileged group living in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, so you have the Ahmadi minority that the state uh, in 1970 something, the state declared them non-Muslim. And you, in order to get your passport, you have to sign like an agreement saying that I think that they are not Muslim. I think that they are non-believers, and I support um, the state's campaign against them. So um, it's it's just it's a it's a really crappy situation. I, I don't know how else to describe it. That's that's going to happen every time we go around trying to to define 
who is or isn't a true Scotsman, atheist, Christian, Muslim, whatever, um, if, if there's any sort of room in the doctrine for interpretation, uh, then everything's out the window. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for taking my call. Uh, my thank heart you, was pounding because I've been watching the show for like a long time. Um, so this was this was cool. And if I'm ever in Austin, I'd love to like pop by around thread deals. Just awesome. like don't confuse. Just like don't think I'm a Muslim because I'm brown when I walk in. <laughs> <laughs> we won't. We, we, I don't. I don't tend to make that assumption. Thanks, Shaw. I appreciate it. If we can go ahead and get um, Joe in Toronto queued up. Uh, yeah, I was going to make the same point about you know I think I don't have statistics either, but I think. I would guess that most of the Christians in this country are cult cultural Christians, and, yeah. they'll, and they'll go to church on the you know the Christmas and Easter, Christmas and Easter, and the, and they identify as Christian, but that's about it. And Jews as well. And those were the Christians that we would, um, you know, there's not a public denouncing, like you know, it's not like we, we would go on TV and say, oh, these aren't real Christians. But in church, oh, it was absolutely known those aren't real Christians. I mean, they they are. Uh, they're not living a life, they're not walking with the Lord. Um, they are cafeteria Christians who pick and choose uh, what, which part they want. And, uh, you know, th th there was this idea, uh, you know, as a Southern Baptist, um, and actually I heard Jerry uh, DeWitt kind of mention something like this last night, um, that being a Christian was hard and it was hard work. And it was actually harder to live by, you know, the New Testament law than it was the Old Testament. Uh, and, and the example that Jerry used last night was, you know, Jesus says, you've heard it said that uh, he who lusts after a woman is, or he, he who commits adultery with a woman is, you know, damned. And I, I'm, I'm saying that he, anybody who lusts after a woman in their heart has committed with adultery with her already. And so on the one hand, you have the Old Testament law, which is about kind of what you do, mm -hmm. and the New Testament law, which is about what you think. And a lot of the things that are what you think uh, are just a part of being a normal human being. Yeah. You're going to lust. Uh, my, my favorite, though, lusting after a woman story um, comes from Chris Johnson, the author uh, and creator of uh, Better Life, the documentary and the book. Um, and he was out, I believe, with my wife uh, and ran across a street preacher who did look, you know, sat there and looked at him. He's like, well, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? And Chris said, no, because Chris is gay. And the preacher uh. did not get that at all. He stood there and said, really? You've never looked at a woman in lust? <clears throat> nope, never have. Just thought he was lying, right? And just, <laughs> and yeah, so, you know, I, this guy's lying to me. No, he's just gay. But So we got Joe in Toronto. Thanks for waiting. Yeah, thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh, been a fan of the show for about a year so far. It's, uh, it's been great. Thank you. Uh, so just to tell you a bit of my background, I'm... Um, I uh, grew up Coptic Orthodox. I'm not sure if you know about them, but they're the the National Christian Church of Egypt. I grew up in Canada, um, and they're a very, very Orthodox church that has been and very conservative. That that's been relatively persecuted in the past and in the present. And there's a lot of um, there's is a lot the, of. It, sorry, it, go ahead. So is it, now this is this is me kind of piecing bits together because I, I'm familiar a little bit with various versions of Orthodox. And you said Coptic Orthodox. Is that because of the location or is it because of appeals to extra biblical Coptic scriptures? No, location. It's okay. Coptic in this mean they're yeah, an Oriental of Orthodox Church. So uh, oh okay. Um so there, there's nothing extra nothing uh, from Coptic scripture. Basically they're non Chalcedonian. Um so they only believe in the first or they only adhere to the first three councils. Um and after that uh things take a bit of an authoritarian regime because nobody really knows what the doctrine is. Um, things get muffled and because well, they were convenient. under Islamic rule for so long, things have been uh, um, a, a bit warped, I, I guess would be the, the way I would say it. But I, I wanted to uh, appeal to you when you were a Christian. I wanted to ask you, growing up as a Christian, um, and I'm an atheist now, uh, I've never had a connection to the emotional suffering of Christ. To me, Jesus dying on the cross or, or rising in three days, it almost, it, it didn't seem to be as impactful to me as, you know, the stories of martyrs or, you know, people getting, crying when they see the passion or watching a passion play or, or, or really feeling that, that emotion. And I just wondered if you were, if you felt that growing up when you were a Christian. 
Yeah, I'm sure there were times. Um, I remember going to passion plays, um, and when I was younger, there's certainly uh, an emotional aspect to the story. I have to admit that it probably didn't resonate with me as much as it did with some other people because there were, I think, some unformed nagging concerns, which I can easily express now. Now when I look at it, you know, uh, I don't see, even if the story were completely true, I don't see that as anything remotely like a sacrifice. Go ahead, beat me, rip me to shreds, uh, let me be dead for three days, and then I get to wake up and I'm God. How, how the hell is that a sacrifice? I mean, that give, oh, well, you had one shitty weekend. I mean, it was a really, really bad weekend, but only actually only part of it was a bad weekend. The rest of it, you, you know, so. yeah, you were dead. <laughs> now, when I was a kid, though, uh, you don't. I didn't look at it in those terms. It was always portrayed as God loves you. You are damned to hell because of your sin, and Jesus came down to pay the price for that. So. My connection with it wasn't so much, oh my gosh, look how much this individual suffered, because I think even then I recognized, hey, wait a minute, he's, he gets to be God, or he is God to start with, he gets to be God again, or who knows, because God can't die, so there's got to be some gap there, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but it was, it was about not so much the sacrifice itself, but the act uh, that allowed us to be redeemed. There was certainly an appreciation for that, but I don't think there was an emotional connection uh, to the to the suffering, and by the time that Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ came out, I just found it a combination of laughable and gory. Yeah, and I agreed with you. I thought it was that was Christian snuff film. porn. Uh, um, <laughs> and when I was when even when I was a Christian at the time, I just thought it was disgusting. Yeah, but when I and when I would argue with that to them, they you know with, with other Christians, they would be they would take it as you don't you didn't understand or you don't you know, feel for Christ's suffering. And I think that might be part of the culture of the Coptic church because we are an Orthodox church. There is a lot of, um, uh, of visual, like there's a lot of icon, uh, icons and, and a lot of chanting and, and, and we, they go through the stages of the cross as well on Good Friday. So there's right. a lot of suffering on that day when you're not eating all day. But, and and uh, I think I, you know, if I, I could look at that and, you know, put myself back in that position. And if somebody from the church had come to me, to say that, you know, maybe there's something wrong with me, that I am insufficiently empathic or empathetic, um, d such that I can't ex express empathy with, with this sacrifice. Um, I think my response to that, even then, would have been, and yet I clearly empathize with actual tragedies. I mean, I can't, I, I'm more likely to cry uh, and, and feel empathy f watching some real living human being uh, be tortured or suffer through disease or starvation or illness or anything like that than I am a story about some supernatural being who voluntarily um, got beaten up. 100% agree. And, and like, I, like I was mentioning before, like for me, the stories of, of martyrs even resonated with me way more than the story of Christ, that these people would would be would be tortured allegedly by the Roman Empire and and they probably have been and then would be martyred without knowing for sure if there is a God that is going to save them. Um, that story, those stories resonated with me more than than any than than any of the gospel stories would have. And I want but, I want to um, just you know John is someone who wasn't ostensibly raised with this sort of thing. When you eventually, you know, were presented with the stories and were able to think about it, how did you view it? Just, it was just a story. Um, I was trying to think of an example of another story where somebody suffered, and it's, it's kind of like that. It's just, uh, I wouldn't feel any empathy for that either. If I was watching a, a movie, I might. But kind of like you were saying, it's, it's so far removed from actual flesh and blood human uh, once, once. Whoa! Just got a weird noise. Um, Sorry, the phone. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, well, you're not going to miss too many phone calls like that. So, okay, I could hear that all the way from Toronto. I, th I think, though, you know, I've had actually had uh, empathy for characters that I knew were fictional, um, and you know, my wife 
is a prime example. No, my wife's not fictional. I'm saying my pri wife's a prime example <laughs> of this sort of thing. Uh, you know, when uh, a certain character dies uh, on one of the shows that she happens to like, she knows the actor's still alive, the character's fictional, she's going to ball like a baby. And I complete answer your phone, dude. And so I, com I completely understand that. And yet here we have a story which people think is real, other people think is a fictional uh, character, and the empathy's not remotely the same. And I think that that says far more about the story and the details of the story than it does about any of us. Uh, because clearly if we were incapable of connecting with a true sacrifice, a true loss, um, we would, you know, this, you wouldn't be able to use that criticism against us because we can empathize with real and fictional losses. Well, and I haven't actually seen, uh, seen the Mel Gibson movie. I've just heard that it's, it's really... It's bloody. Over the top bloody. And I would probably have an emotional reaction to seeing that. It's kind of like I did when I saw uh, 12, Day, 12 Years a Slave or whatever that movie was called. Just yep. seeing people whipped and suffering, regardless of who it is, is hard to watch. And, and I didn't, and I think it's because Gibson's is so over the top. It almost becomes cartoonish to the point where you can't remotely connect with this individual. And the story itself of it being God in human form already makes it difficult for you to connect to that individual. It's, you know, hmm. Dobby the house elf uh, is more real to me, and I felt worse about his loss or losing him than I did about Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, and in that movie, I mean, you're right. You know what's going to happen. You know the ultimate the ultimate ending in it is that he becomes God. And, and you're right, it was very over the top. I mean, I remember the one thing that I remember vividly from that movie is when they're putting the crown of thorns on him, they almost beat it on his head to, to drive the thorns into his head, which, I mean, I don't know if there's any, any evidence that that, that story is even in the Bible like that or even, you know, um, believed by the, by the Catholics or by old Catholics that that's what happened as well. Yeah. Um, I did have a second comment or a second uh, statement to bring up. Okay. So I am, um, I've lived in Canada my whole life. I'm in my 30s. I'm independent. Um, but the the cultural connection of, of the Coptic Church is very similar to, like, I guess, even your previous caller. Um, there are, there Except are they're not likely to kill I'm, you. Sorry, what's that? Except they're probably not going to kill you. No, the, the, the difference is this, is um, decisions that I make could have a fundamental impact on my parents' um, well-being or livelihood. Um, right. And I'll, I'll give you an example. They're in business. Um, the, the community we live in in Toronto, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, how, with, with Canada's multiculturalism, but there's an element of ghettoization where a community sticks to its own and they all live in the same area. Um, for example, the city of Vaughan, just north of Toronto, is almost all Italian. Uh, cities uh, to the west in Brampton is almost all Indian. And where we are, there's a large Coptic Egyptian community. And to give you an example, if I don't marry in the church, um, and I, I would either have a common law relationship um, or, or marry somewhere else, it could have an impact on how my parents um, are seen in the church culturally yep. and could have a negative impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if you would, if you ever hear, like, I don't know if, 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 if situations are similar in, in, you know, most American Christian communities, but it's just a comment that I want to bring up. Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, I could certainly imagine that, there might be churches that, for example, my parents might go to, and if they found out that, you know, they were the, uh, the parents of the, you know, arch-atheist of Austin, uh, that might have, there are churches where they might be you know, looked down upon or they made a mistake, and I know that my parents have on occasion felt that they, you know, failed me as a spiritual leader, but I don't think that that's the norm. I think pr predominantly the this much in the same way that you can have a pastor who goes out and does something absolutely horrific 
and it may work out to be the best thing they could ever do as long as they're willing to get up in front of the church, talk about what they did and how Jesus redeemed them from this and turned them from this, and now they have a stronger witness and they're better. It could end up, they could end up making more money and have more kind of prominence within some churches that way. Um, in some cases, it's the end of a pastoral career, and it's some cases right. it's it's a bump that has a huge spike afterwards. So I, I really couldn't say how any individual church or even denomination would look at it, uh, but none of it's without risk. And coming out as a non-believer, um, you know, I can only really talk a bit about in the United States, uh, but we know it has risks. We have. Um, people who've lost, being, you know, been ostracized by their families, been you know ostracized by their communities, in some cases, kicked out of homes and had to move to a new town uh, to find a place to live and 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 try to live a life. And then you've got to rebuild this network, and that's why there are organizations like Recovering from Religion, um, the Secular Therapist Project, people dealing with uh, religious trauma syndrome, and organizations like um, Sunday Assembly and Oasis, where we're building sort of uh, landing pads for people on their way out of religion because if you've lost your entire community it's so nice if there's actually another community who not only uh, you you can associate with where there's largely like-minded people but in the many of whom are coming from the same situations where they lost their social network where they lost the members of their family um, for nothing more than being intellectually honest about what they believe Right, and I have, and my parents are aware of 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 who I am, and, and so are all my friends, and it, and it doesn't impact us. I I like the the community I'm in. It I think it's almost the broader society as a whole, as a micro society, um, in the in in the greater Toronto area. Um, in general, Canada tends to be a lot more secular than the states, or at least the South, or or at least Texas. And uh, although I, mean, I was in Alberta, Alberta's. The fifty-first state. <laughs> yeah, um, it's so fundamentally different than it's Toronto. North Although Texas. they elected a, a, when we had Rob Ford, they had elected a very secular Muslim mayor in Calgary. Um, at the same time that Toronto elected a very right-wing and ultimately very flawed Rob Ford. Um, but uh, I mean, an example: the United Church of Canada, the, the largest Protestant denomination in Canada, has had moderators come out publicly stating that they did not believe Jesus rose from the dead, um, which I'm not sure if, if some of the larger uh, American denomina Protestant denominations could have the same statement from a moderator. Methodist could. Um, that a might Methodist be, could? That, that might be about the only one. <clears throat> and right. most of the rest of them find themselves uh, kind of in UU churches, Unitarian Universalists, um, which is John's expertise. Or United Church of Christ, but they're they're not a major denomination anymore. Yeah, uh, and Universalists were the biggest denomination in America in the 1800s, but they've they're small now. Yeah, that that kind of didn't pan out. And I think you know personally, I don't have any problem or any. I'm not a fan of UU churches for me uh, because I think that there's. A lot of let's water everything down and maybe even delve into some woo or kind of get fuzzy with the language about spirituality or whatever in order to appeal to many people without offending. And I, I understand that. And I appreciate it. And it's the right thing for some people. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not one of those people. Well, you talked about having a landing pad. And in some places, UU Church is maybe the only landing pad an atheist might have yep. that's, that's even... Close. So. Yeah, if you don't if you don't have anything else, the UU churches, I'd rather look at it as a halfway house than, <laughs> than a landing pad. But I'm I'm not saying that just to be insulting. I just find it kind of amusing. Anyway, Joe, I appreciate the call. Okay, can I ask just one more question very quickly? Or sure. Um, this is it's it's something slightly unrelated. But when people ask me about um, what my beliefs are, what what I or how I identify as an atheist, I just want your take on this. Um, I don't believe there is a God um, in the sense that if anybody defines a God, because I don't believe that one has revealed himself to us, that definition, that definition will almost certainly be incorrect. 
Um, there could be something beyond the scope that could be technically a god, but because we do not have any evidence of it, any attempt to define it would be almost positively incorrect. Yeah, so I think the, the only minor subtle objection is that instead of saying there could be a god, um, I think it's a little more cl clear and accurate to say we don't know that there couldn't be. Because could is a declaration about what's possible. And right. I, know, I know there are people who are like, oh, well, anything's possible. Uh, and I'm not actually convinced that that's the case because there are, we know that there are some things that are at least logically contradictory. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not overly picky um, about the labels people use or how they choose to explain it because it may take a number of different explanation styles for people to get it. And what's more important, I think, is I, I don't want people to be able to say they've never met a non-believer, they've never met an atheist, and they've never met any atheist or non-believer who can't give an account for why they don't believe. That's one of the reasons I do what I do. Uh, and if they walk away with their faith strengthened, yeah, okay, that's a little annoying, but at least they were able to consider it. But they don't ever get to say that, oh, atheists, oh, they, I, I guess they can keep saying it since they do, but they can't have any good justification for doing the, oh, atheists are just mad at God, or you're professed atheists and you actually do believe in God, because uh, that's a bunch of crap. Right. Anyways, thanks, Matt. I, I, it was great talking to you today. Thanks, Joe. We can, uh, I guess we'll get Thaddeus from Springfield hooked up on here next. Uh, so on the landing pad front uh, versus halfway house, mm -hmm. um, I have virtually no experience in a UU church. It's all been secondhand information from people, you know, and I know that they're incredibly good on like sex education, which we've talked about before. Uh, what, just for the benefit of the people who aren't familiar, if you were to go to a UU church on a Sunday, what would you expect? It's, it's, it's very much like the typical Protestant church experience. You'll, you know, you'll go in and you'll get a program and you'll, to, now, now this, I guess I should have a caveat that all churches are different sure. and, and they all kind of have their own flavor, but typically... There'll be a, you know, there'll be a choir, or there'll be a, there'll be a couple of hymns, and there's a sermon, and the sermon can be, you know, it can run the gamut from, uh, you know, about other religions or some philosophical point or, you know, social justice kind of thing. It just, you know, typically up to the minister, and some ministers kind of have their own strengths and areas they like to talk about, but it's it, it's very typical as far as uh, what a lot of churches do as far as format goes. And then it just kind of has a more, uh, depending on the church, it has a more universal feel where they try to avoid the, the you know, the male God language and try to be, you know, so I, broaden it and that sort of thing. Um, so my, my impression is that you know, on occasion there are UU services, um, which I've either seen or heard about, where the, the sermon portion is uh, more of like a motivational speech about something related to real life, something like you'd find perhaps in a Reformed Judaism temple where they're focused on this life and the things that we do in this life. But I've also heard uh, about UU churches where they're probably more deistic or vague theistic where there's still an appeal to either a universal intelligence or a connectedness in, or even a God thing without, like you were saying, without the gender language. Right. Um, okay. I, think, I think you'll see all of that. and it, it depends a lot on the church and the day you go. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'll get very earth-centered pagan uh, a service where you, you know, actually might... Uh, get up and do some a pagan ritual or a dance or you know walk a labyrinth or it, it could be anything. I think one of the things that surprises me most about the UU Church is that you know we see lots of religious conflict in the world, and there's over a thousand denominations uh, that identify. Sorry, I'm having problems with my earbud. That identify as Christian, 
and they disagree on every single point of doctrine, including whether or not Jesus actually lived or existed as a real person or whether this is a metaphoric tale. And, you know, you end up with, with the First Baptist Church, the Second Baptist Church, and the Third Baptist Church because of disagreements when they're almost in, in exact alignment. And yet you've got a UU church. And I know there have been some splits, and obviously people have had disagreements. But I would think that getting a collection of pe people where somebody is an incredibly liberal kind of progressive uh, Christian, somebody else is a deist, somebody else is a pagan, somebody else is an atheist, and we're going to try to make something that appeals to all of them, mm -hmm. I think you might as well just get out a deck of cards and play a game, because <laughs> everything else is, I don't, I don't know why it doesn't cause people to just walk out every time. But. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, and it's generally people who can get together and, and just kind of listen to what the other people think and not object to it, at least, or at least say, oh, that's interesting, you know, that you... I think there's a temperament, that. which I have objections to, and that is uh, agreeing to disagree. Mm -hmm. um, I, have no, I have no problem at all agreeing that we, in fact, do disagree. Uh, but I find that when people do the, oh, let's just agree to disagree, it's, uh, I view it as an admission that they just lost the argument. <laughs> But I think the, the, the feeling that I get from it is more of a, oh, well, there's no way to know which one of us is right. Mm -hmm. and, and that I don't necessarily think is true, but it depends on the issue. Right. Yeah, because sometimes there is a way to know. You can test things and come up with the best answer. Yeah, and then that's where we get into discussions about you know, how to label you know, atheism or whatever else. Because if a the theism is, I believe that a God exists, and atheism is, I do not believe that a God exists, well... When we talk about, is there good reason to believe that a God exists? I think that, you know, clearly I think that any reasoned uh, evaluation of the case, the answer has to be no. There's no good reason to believe this. Uh, there's tons and tons of bad reasons, which is how we've been doing a show all these years. But anyway, Thaddeus in Springfield, thanks for waiting. What's up? Hey, how you hey, doing? Thaddeus. <clears throat> I'm Mark. I'll say, uh, before I get into my question, I would just like to mention, you guys were talking about the uh, Passion of the Christ. Yeah. And I remember when that movie came out, I was 10 years old, and my mom made me go to the theater to watch that. How, what did you think about it? And, and what was your religious view at the time, and what did you think well, about the movie? To be quite honest, I don't think I could ever call myself a Christian. Like, in all honesty, I was just scared into believing into it. And sure. I, I mean, around the time I turned 15, I was just like, no, it's bullshit. But I remember... The movie there was one part where they're nailing him to the cross and while they like hit the nail like there was some guy off screen that had to like squirt up blood yep. as they hit that nail and i was just like dude like saw doesn't even go that far what the heck <laughs> but i mean did, did you did you cry did you feel sad about what was happening to that individual i felt sick yeah it's kind of gross it was far i i think you've hit it on the head i think it was closer to saw than to an actual tragedy, but and, uh, and that's like that's the Jesus movie that made the most bucks. Like the recent one, Son of God, didn't even come close. Yeah, it's like yeah, bloody bloody Christ made all the money. But my question is, um, I go to church with my mom because she has cancer, and I want to make her feel good. Sure. Um, I just don't want to start a fight with her when she's going to be dead in the next ten to fifteen months. So. Um, I'm I'm very sorry to hear about your mom's condition, but I can completely appreciate it. And not that you need any uh, uh, approval from us, but I'd probably do the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and there was a uh, the, the the preacher. He often will put on video clips because it's a it's not a mega church, but it is a big church, and there's a gigantic like flat screen up in the front, almost like a movie movie theater screen, but not mm -hmm. quite. And he'll put like videos up there of like atheist versus christian debate sometimes oh wow. and um he did a he, he put up a podcast up there with frank turek yeah and frank turek was talking about the omnipotence paradox where you know it's usually presented as can god create a stone so heavy he himself cannot lift it and i was right. like yeah i mean it's a valid question can he and then frank turek goes off into this spiel about how god can't do things that are logically impossible because right. a stone so heavy god can't lift it is like logically impossible therefore it can't exist yeah and modern theologians have redefined what they mean by omnipotence yeah, as all power like, that is logically possible and so god doesn't have to have all power including the power to violate logic he just has to be the single most powerful being possible 
and then, I don't have like, a problem with that. It can, it, like I fall back on the Ithifro dilemma. Like whenever yeah. you present that, they're all like, "Well, he is the good," and then you can just step it back. Well, you know what determines what is good? Like what determines his nature? Yeah, it's a little different when you get else. into the to, into the morality thing versus but, omnipotence. Yeah, but when you, they say, "Okay, we well, can't defy the laws of logic," well, then what determines the laws of logic? No, they're not determined. They're just they're just the facts. Uh, they're, they're just the facts of of well. But everything, not just reality. Something but. that created everything, not then in turn be the creator of the laws of logic. So the, the, there's a view of God that um, God is also bound by these, I, the, whether you call them logical absolutes, laws of logic, laws of thought, whatever. We're talking about identity, non contradiction, blue to middle. And uh, they are so clearly. Um, Fallacious. Abs no, no, no. They're, they're the real deal. They're the foundation of all reasonable thought. And they are so clearly absolute and inviolate that it has forced theologians to rework the language they use to describe how God can operate. And most, most modern theologians that, that you know, have a, an understanding of you know, basic philosophy who aren't just, you know, the, I started preaching at 12 uh, and, and didn't bother for any of that book learning other than the good book. Uh, most of them acknowledge that this is, must be the case. Uh, and then they don't have a particular problem with it because it, there's no need for a God or the God to be able to violate the laws of logic. To, in order to still they be... come from if they're not created by the creator of the universe? So they, they, they don't they don't come from anywhere. They they are so they true even if nothing exists. A supreme being. What's that? So they supersede the existence of a pre, the supreme being. Yes. So now we have a concept that is more eternal than an eternal being. Yeah. Well, see, the, they're they're <laughs> not something that exists. They're not things or entities. Well, the, I mean, these are just descriptions of truths, and they're true even if nothing exists. Yeah, but I mean, well, ontologically speaking, if the laws of logic exist they have no in, ontology. Our, in our mind, then the, 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 does the concept itself not exist? Like, for example, morality. They don't tech, morals don't technically exist other than what we determine them to be. Yeah, good, good and evil don't exist as things. They have no ontology, much like the, the laws I of mean, thought that we're talking But good and evil are labels that we put on things, evaluating consequences with respect to goals. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Uh, huh. So actually, Frank Turek is somebody that I, you know, I'm at least looking forward to the the possibility of debating in the future. I think there was discussion once in the past, but it didn't actually happen. Uh, but this idea, so the omnipotence paradox, um, I'll probably do a video on it at some point because the simplistic can God create a rock so big he can't lift it? Um, it only addresses notions of God that are naive well, and they, I, it's I not a response it, to anything that, you know, most modern theologians would posit. You know, I, I present it in a different way. I don't, you know, I try not to um, present it using um, our standards of measurement, like example, weight. Um, I, I would say rather, can God create something he himself could not even destroy? Yeah, for example, it, himself. Anything could, can can could God do? Himself. Can God do the logically impossible? And the answer is no. So, then omnipotence just is just arbitrarily defined as whatever people want to define it as, I guess. Well, it, so it's a simplistic notion, omnipotence. Um, and when the flaws in the, the simplistic notion were presented, reasonable people said, "Ah, oh, clearly." Uh, we don't mean that. So the only thing that they're saying, to the extent that they will say God is omnipotent, is that God is maximally powerful. He is the most powerful being. He has all power and capability that is not logically contradictory. And that's fine. Uh, they can define their God however they want. You could define a God that, hey, he's not the most powerful being. He's the, uh, you know, 10% shy of being the most powerful being and still <laughs> say that like, that's what, what, sorry? It's the concept of infinity. Like you could give the biggest number you want to give, but you're nowhere close to infinity. You could be as, as powerful as you want to be as powerful, but if you're not omnipotent, you're nowhere, clear, clear, uh, nowhere close to omnipotence. 
Yeah, but you're either omnipotent or you're not. You there's no requirement. There's no there's no intrinsic requirement about the God label that it must have omnipotence or omniscience well, I mean, or omnipresence. The Abrahamic God is described as such in the No, Abraham's it's not. Text, that, that, that's that's the thing is it's actually not. Those words omnipotent, omniscient, none of those exist in the text. Uh, there are concepts that are about God knows everything that can be known, or, and, and they are simplified as God knows all, or God can do all things. But, and the ancient people probably didn't have any understanding of God can do all things that are logically possible. But you, you don't get to judge the, the, the God concept that's being offered based on uh, a straw man version that people from the past understood. You can say that the God that, you know, if you believe in this God, he clearly doesn't exist. And I'm with that all day long. We can demonstrate that logically inconsistent beings don't exist. But that's not a response to somebody who's saying God isn't omnipotent in the old sense. He is maximally powerful. But then isn't that just playing semantics to suit a narrative? No. Uh, like, if we're going to just switch words around to mean something now that they didn't then, I mean, we're just... No, because well because that because that, that would only be true if you were saying the ancient people had a clearer understanding and concept of God than the modern people do. And the modern people are saying that's not the case. If the modern people were saying the ancient people, you know, apart from Adam and Eve who may or may not have walked with a God, uh, but they're not the ones that are telling you anything... But if the, if the modern people were saying, yes, these ancient people understood God better than we do, then you would be able to, to talk about what those ancient people meant in the words that they used. But if the modern theologians are saying that they understand God better than the ancient people did, then you have to address the God that the modern people are, are doing. Otherwise, you're attacking a straw man. I see. Um, Besides, it's, well, it's an arbitrary definition anyway. You could, you know... You, come up with a god and you can give it whatever attributes you want so there's you know if you want to say maximally powerful you can, yeah, I mean, you can say that and that's the god that you're positing there's still you still don't have any evidence for that god the ancient greek and roman gods were not omnipotent and yet they were still gods yeah but no you, um i i yeah I, I do that sometimes i'll like uh, for example when someone pres pre uh presents pascal's wager to me i'll be like okay well what if my god who only likes people who wear nike shoes yep. is the real god then then what i wear nikes so i wear nikes on occasion mostly i wear boots <laughs> but i have some nikes so do you have to wear the nikes all the time no as long as you wear nike shoes at some point in your lifetime it's like the concept of some, we're going to nike person. heaven <laughs> <laughs> unless you're like poor and don't wear shoes at all how do you know that the Nikes you have are real and not like cheap knockoffs that just somebody put the swoosh on? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Damn to hell for, for not yep. wearing proper Nikes. So, yeah, that's that's how I just repeat that. with the Anyway, with your false economy. Um, that is, yeah. I appreciate the call. I've got one more call I want to try to get to before we run out of time, if that's oh, all right. Yeah. yeah, thanks, man. Bye. Appreciate it. Yeah, let's go ahead and get Victor uh, queued up. Did you want to, you might have had more to say on the omnipotence thing. No, I just uh, I think it's it's sort of like saying God is maximally purple. It's like okay, <laughs> uh, whatever he is the you know. Purplest being that could have. Yeah, it's it, it it's it, there's a an issue of kind of colloquialisms, and uh, if I were to say you know, oh man, my wife can cook anything or do anything or sew anything or whatever. Uh, there's a slight exaggeration there that's kind of understood because she can't, she can't knit an earth literally, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, an, an actual, another planet for us to live on. Um, and understanding that that's the case, uh, if someone were to say, Oh, well you're wrong because you know, here's an example of something, you know, that's clearly logically absurd for your wife to, you have to talk about it. That's one of the reasons why I like to do the, Tell me what you believe and why, because one of the biggest mistakes that atheists can make is to uh, saddle someone with views that they don't necessarily have. Mm -hmm. Now, if they say, I'm a Bible believing what, what to whatever, um, then you can talk about what the Bible says and, and have a discussion about where you may or may not disagree. But if you start, you know, if you're talking to a Protestant 
and you start talking about how they believe that the cracker turns into the literal body of Christ through transubstantiation, you just told them you don't know what the hell you're talking about because that's a predominantly Catholic doctrine that they have never believed. And so now you're arguing against some God. You know, when I was a Southern Baptist, Catholics were Mary worshiping, idol worshiping, non Christians. They were in a cult that where the Pope and the church were the true uh, foundation and not Jesus Christ and not the Bible. And that's why they have extra books that weren't part of We Catholics are great people. We loved them because that's what we were supposed to do. But they're, you know, they're a bunch of heathens pretending to be Christians. I mean, that was the view that we had. And if you came to me and started talking about Catholic doctrine uh, when I was a Southern Baptist, I would have agreed with you all day long. Yep, yep. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. That's stupid doctrine. Oh, how can they believe that? But I want to make sure we get to uh, Victor in Clearwater before we finish out the day. Victor, are you there? Yep. How you doing? Hey, Victor. Good. How are you? I'm pretty good. All right. So uh, my name's. Victor, I've been an atheist for only about six months, and part of the reason for that was watching this show. Oh, awesome. So, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. But yeah, basically, uh, I'm 16, and uh, I'm the only one in my family who's an atheist from an all-fundamentally all Christian family. Are, are they aware? Yeah. And we regularly, roughly speaking, we what, regularly, de what denomination or style of... Christian, are they? Yeah, they uh, Non-denominational. Okay. We used to go to Willow Creek Church in Illinois. It's like a mega church. Yeah. We used to go there, and the pastor's Bill Hybels, and they, uh, they're they very fundamentalist and all that kind of thing. And I was wondering, what are the, some of the like best disproofs that are really simple and hard to beat around the bush for against Christianity specifically? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a mistake in kind of what you're looking for. And the mistake is presuming that it's up to anybody to disprove uh, the claims or doctrines. That's yeah, no, no, my, my bad. I worded it funny. Uh, I'm, I mean, like, specifically biblical contradictions, like two things in the Bible that literally cannot coincide. Well, see, one of the things is you'll find huge lists of contradictions, and some of those lists have some good things in it, um, and some of them may not necessarily be clear contradictions. And so it's probably, it's not often useful to, you know, point out um, these, like this passage says this and this passage says the opposite. That's exceptionally rare and, and maybe virtually non-existent, depending on how much you're going to allow somebody uh, to interpret what the text says. You know, when you talk about the different genealogies that are listed in the Gospels, yes, they don't match up. But their apologists will say, oh, well, one of them is tracing the lineage through Mary and the other one's tracing the lineage through Joseph. And then you have to have a conversation about, well, why would you do that, especially if Joseph isn't the father? Yeah. And uh, moreover, you know, one of the things you can keep going to is this idea that if the Bible is inspired by God and God is not the author of confusion, why is the Bible so confusing? And what I much more prefer to do is to point out uh, how the, the moral declarations in the Bible don't match what any of us accept as moral. You know, I frequently go after slavery. I won't go on a tirade about it right now because I'm on record of having discussed it probably 500 I'm, times. I'm very familiar. <laughs> but also, you know, if you take a look at the order of events that are listed in Genesis as the order of creation, they don't match the scientific understanding of the origins of the earth and the universe and life. Um, there are much, I think, much stronger cases to be made about uh, how the Bible views and treats uh, women uh, with regard to mm -hmm. equality, you know, who, who's subservient to who, why is this the case? And I prefer to go look at it from a slightly different perspective. Their view, my, my you know, religious family's view, is that God is real and obvious, um, and I'm in rebellion or denying it or something. And I try to get them to understand that, no, it's, it's not obvious, and I don't think it's obvious to you either, despite what you say. Because you think that there's a God who loves me. If you told me that you loved someone, 
I would then, you know, say, okay, how do they know that you love them? You know, how does my wife know that I love her? Well, the things that I say, the things that I do, the way that I act when I'm around her, those sorts of things are how we would normally determine if somebody loves another person. We're pretty good at it. You watch a new, uh, a new mother with a, a newborn baby, and you can tell pretty well whether or not they are accurately expressing the sort of love and empathy for that child that you would expect, or if perhaps they're suffering from postpartum depression or some other psychological break that would make them not connect with that individual. And now you get to this issue of God, and God loves me. How do I know that? What expression of God's love in my entire life can anyone point to to show that there is a God who actually loves me? All I've ever heard is people telling me how much God loves me. Don't, I don't ever hear it from God. I don't see any demonstrations of it. I see people pointing to an ancient book where God loved me so much that he sent his only begotten son. Well, first of all, anybody who loves me would know that I would never ask or expect that and wouldn't con consider it a good thing. Uh, you know, if you say, oh, I love you so much that I went out and killed this kitty, uh, <laughs> that's not an expression of love. That's, that's atrocious. Yeah. And, and then if you don't love him back, then he loves you so much that you'll get tortured forever. Yeah, depending on what the, somebody's views of hell are, yeah. yeah. I love you so much that I can't stand to have your imperfectness in my presence, and so I will tor put, send you to a place where you're tormented forever. But setting aside the doctrine of hell, what, what reason would anybody have to think that God loves them other than there's a book that says that God loves them? Yeah, well... My parents are like, they're the type of people who, they don't really look at facts and things like that, even though my mom's a biology major and she's also a young earth creationist, which are two things that just don't make sense to me going together at all. I just read a news story about a retired science teacher who went before the city council and got them to refuse to put in a solar panel uh, power generation facility because she thought it would soak up all the energy from the sun and kill yeah. off the plants. I, the, just because you happen to have a degree in something doesn't mean you uh, you necessarily understand it. And you're right. If they if they're not interested in facts, then the conversation that you need to have has nothing to do with whether or not their actual religion is true, but whether or not they care about whether or not their religion is true more than they care whether or not it's comforting. And then you have to have the discussion about how do we go about figuring out whether or not something's real. Yeah, I've. I've tried to talk about that. We normally end up talking about it during dinner and things because I'm almost never in the house. But whenever we end up talking about it, I always bring up simple things that like, they can't necessarily say are false because I'll be like, oh, no, why is homosexuality bad? And my mom will say things like, oh, it's proven to make you die sooner and stuff like that. And I'm just like, that's just not true. Even if it was, can, even if it were true, that doesn't mean that it's a, that, that enough is alone to override right, yeah, yeah. What, who someone is and what they want to do and how they want to live their life. If I want to do, you know what else has been proven to potentially make you, uh, actually, since homosexuality hasn't, uh, skydiving. Is skydiving immoral? I mean, it's risky. You don't have to do it. You're, 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 taking an, you're increasing the likelihood that you might die. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, so that's, I mean, it's just, if they're only just going to make horrible arguments and appeals to the ancient book, then you have to take a step away from the religion entirely. It is, it is a method of kind of stealth discussion, the Socratic method where you're primarily asking questions, but moving it away from the specifics of what they believe to a meta-level discussion about if someone came to you and told you this story, would you believe it just because they told you? And what would it take to make you believe it? And you use some other example, whether it's you know alien abduction or something analogous to any other religion, and then should point out that they are engaged in special pleading on behalf of their own religion because they're not using the same standards to judge truth for the things that they already accept. Yeah, I said uh, my mom made some art. I mean, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I told her she was using special pleading and that that was a fallacy. And she just was like, well, no, it's not because it's God. 
And I said, the fallacy is you have to explain why it's not because it's God. And she's just like, well, just because you don't have to, you don't have the intelligence to understand God. Why would you question God's will? Ah, that's what you say when you don't really have an, an answer <laughs> it's yeah, like at that point. That's what I say. I always yeah, your mom is exactly like Cy Ten Bergenkate, who did that when I pointed out that he was engaged in special pleading. His answer was, no, it's not because it's God. Um, yeah, but exactly. but uh, your your kind of second point there about when she she's basically saying you know who are you to question God uh, I just did a video <laughs> on that on my YouTube channel just last week or the week before um, and and I find this I find this a really absurd thing because they want you to accept this proposition as true and good. And that means that they are asking you to evaluate it. And you're not questioning God. You're questioning your mom's claims about God. You're questioning the Bible's claims about God. You're questioning the veracity of the sources of information. I would be happy to question God if he'd ever fucking show up. That's, I agree 100%. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's, it's funny because every time I say, well, how do you know who God is? And she says, through the Bible. And I say, a whole bunch of things like you said with your uh, the superiority of secular morality arguments, etc. I always bring up those kinds of points. She's like, well, that doesn't make sense because what I know is moral contradicts that. Therefore, it can't be that's what the Bible was trying to say. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it's so the big thing is every reason that she gives is a reason that somebody else could give for a different religious belief. You know, oh, where do you, I, I get my thing from the Bible. Well, so do all of the other Christians in other denominations that you don't agree with. And all of the Muslims get their moral views from the Quran. Um, you know, all of the objections that religions launch against secular morality, none of them are solved by appealing to ancient books or deities. The, the same problems are there. Oh, well, what do you do? What do you do, Matt, Mr. Genius, anti-God, moral guy, if, uh, if somebody doesn't agree with your view about morality? Well, I present evidence and reasoned argument. What do you do if I don't agree with your Bible's book of morality? Oh, you just declare that I'm immoral by fiat and the conversation's over. Which one of us is actually willing to engage on the subject rather than pleading to a special revelation or a special... Uh, a deity that solves the problem. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. solve a thing, which is I why there have been religious that. wars forever. Yeah. All right, well, that was pretty much all that I had to talk about. I don't know. I want to make sure that John gets to say, because he's coming from a different background and often has a different view uh, of what you might best consider doing talking to your mom. I, right. I mean, I think you're doing it. Just keep... Just keep challenging her and asking her questions. It sounds like she's at least open to discussing the subject. Hasn't kicked you out. She hasn't kicked you out. Um, you know, Not we always dead. we always say if 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 you're dependent on them for your survival, it's best to sometimes choose your battles. But um, mm -hmm. you know, I think to whatever extent she's listening to what you're saying and thinking about it, I think that's a good thing. And you can just basically keep doing what you're doing and, and make her think about it, make her kind of justify to herself why she believes these things, and who, who knows? The thing about her, also my dad, my, uh, they think things like their level of proof isn't really that high. Like my yeah. dad says one of the things that makes him rock solid, 100% sure the God is real, is one time he was in a church in a third world country where he was donating a lot of money to them, and someone told him, keep doing what you're doing. I saw it in my dream that you have to keep doing this, which if that's the highest level of proof that he has, I just don't know what else I can give. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me go ahead and kind of close on this. And it's a, it's a mix of advice that I've given in the past before. Uh, number one, one of the things that helped me kind of get the relationship with my parents, not back to normal, but to a new normal was they believe there's a God. They believe God wants me to know he exists. They believe that he's willing to reveal himself to me. And they know that if God ever revealed himself to me, I would then say, yep, there's definitely a God. It's, it's been revealed to me. Whether or not I worship him, separate se question. And that God has a plan. They also believe that. And so rather than continually giving me testimonial anecdotal evidence, the best thing they could do is pray for God to include it in his plan that he would reveal himself to me. And that took the, the weight of the responsibility off of them. 
And the last little note about all of this, because you know, I'm always reluctant to to dig into giving advice to uh, to minors and undermining their parents uh, and everything. But you know, I'm I'm going to be honest about it. Uh, be yourself. Um, let your parents know that you know the fact that you disagree on this is not an assessment of your uh, relationship with them or how much you care about them. Uh, be open and honest to questions. Be willing to say you don't know. If they want to, you know, force you to go to church, go and take lots of notes and ask lots of questions. Maybe they'll make stop making you go. Um, maybe it will help them. I haven't been to church in a while now. It's been a while. Well, you don't need it. But yeah, on the off chance have, that they Sunday push it. My Sunday morning's open. It's awesome. Yeah. On the off chance that they push it, though, it's also not remotely the end of the world. Because even after you get out from underneath your parents' roof and are living your own life, you're not done dealing with religion and religious believers. And the more information you have, the better conversations you can have to maybe help other people reach uh, the conclusions or free themselves from wrong conclusions in the way that you have. All right. Thanks, Victor. I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody, for the uh, studio audience that's sitting out there on the other side of the fish tank who uh, showed up. I will not be here next week. I think Russell is uh, hosting. And then on the 27th, there won't be an episode of The Atheist Experience. After this show is over, we get together, uh, a lot of us, and go to uh, Threadgills on Riverside Drive. Um, uh, no, Lamar. on Lamar. Sorry, the, the older Threadgills on Lamar. Uh, they probably would, can put the address up at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if I don't see you, well, I won't see you because I'm, I'm heading out for my Christmas vacation. Uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever the hell you celebrate. Or if you don't celebrate anything, solstice, whatever. Um, take some time off for yourself. Appreciate who you are. Appreciate your family. Let people know that you appreciate them. Um, I can't think of anything too, important, too, too much more important than that. And I've said before that, you know, while we talked a little bit about Christmas at the, at the beginning of the episode and how it's not explicitly Christian and primarily secular, the aspects of Christmas that I enjoy are the sort of things that should be invented if they hadn't been already. The taking time to appreciate people, let them know you love them, you care about them, interact, catch up on the, the events that happened in your life over the year with people that you might not have had a chance to interact with much in the past year, uh, I can't think of too many things that are more humanist than that. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.